In this video, I want to talk about identifying linear or exponential growth. When we start with the description of a scenario, it's fairly simple to distinguish between linear and exponential growth as long as you're paying attention. So the first example here is linear growth. A population of 500 grows by 10 people every year. And so there's a finite quantity that is growing by every year, and that produces a consistent rate of change. In other words, a consistent slope. The next example was exponential. Listen to the wording. A population of 500 grows by 10% every year. That's the key right there, the percent. We're no longer working off a fixed quantity. We're working off a percent of whatever's there every year. And that actually produces a consistent growth ratio. The ratio of every pair of numbers should be consistent instead of the slope being consistent. So when we begin with a set of data, it's not so clear what kind of growth is represented, but we can look at whether there's either a constant rate of change or a constant growth ratio between evenly spaced data points. And that's relatively important. We do need to pay attention to whether our data points are evenly spaced. So the first example we're going to look at are projections of worldwide VR video gaming sales revenue in billions of US dollars from 2016 to 2020. So keep in mind, some of these are projections. The first thing we're gonna do is check for a consistent rate of change. In other words, we're checking for linear growth. Our table has two rows, the year and the revenue. I'm gonna read you the pairs. 2016 has a revenue of 3.6 billion US dollars. 2017 has a revenue of 5.8, 2018 a revenue of 9.6, 2019 a revenue of 15.1, and 2020 a revenue of 22.9 billion US dollars. So the first thing we should notice is whether the data is evenly spaced. And by that, I mean, are we counting up by the same amount each time from 2016 to 2017, from 2017 to 2018, to 2019 to 2020? And we do see here that we have evenly spaced data. That's really nice because it makes our rate of change calculations really easy. Remember the numerator is the dependent variable and the denominator is the independent variable when we find rates of change. I'm gonna start with the first data pair. And if I was to calculate a rate of change for this, I would do the dependent difference on top, that would be 5.8 minus 3.6, and then the independent difference on the bottom, which would be 2017 minus 2016. And the denominator for every pair we do is going to be just one. So I'm gonna move this over to the side so you can remember how we did this calculation but I'm gonna simplify my calculation quite a bit and simply look at the difference of the numerators, the dependent variables. Our first difference is 5.8 minus 3.6, which is 2.2. The next one is 9.6 minus 5.8, which is 3.8. The next one is 15.1 minus 9.6, which is 5.5. And the last one is 22.9 minus 15.1, which is 7.8. You can see that this rate of change that we've calculated is not very consistent. It seems to be growing as we move across the data points. Instead, let's see if this data set has a consistent growth ratio. Now we're checking for exponential growth. It is the exact same data set, and so we already know the data is evenly spaced, and it's evenly spaced by one year. When we look for a consistent growth ratio, we take each successive pair of data points and find the ratio of the points. In other words, we're trying to find by what ratio the data grew or fell by. So for this first set, I would do 5.8 divided by 3.6, which comes out to be 1.611. The second set would be 9.6 divided by 5.8, which comes out 1.655. The next set would be 15.1 divided by 9.6, which is 1.573. Then 22.9 divided by 15.1, which is 1.517. Now, these growth ratios are much closer together than the rate of change calculations were. For this reason, it seems more likely that the data is exponential than that the data is linear. Let's go ahead and calculate an average for these growth ratios so that we can use that in the model we're going to develop. Let me add up the four ratios and divide that by four. 
to get an average of 1.589. So there's my average growth ratio. Because we know a lot about this scenario, we actually do know the initial value and we have a growth rate we've estimated for the data. Let's go ahead and declare the variables, re-index the time, and make a model for this data, assuming that it must be exponential based on our relatively consistent growth ratios. I need to start by re-indexing my time. I'm gonna let t be the number of years since 2016. That means that my re-indexing for t will be 2016 is year zero, 2017 year one, 2018 year two, 2019 year three, and 2020 year four. I'm going to let capital R stand for the projected revenue from VR gaming in billions. The initial value of my data, that is what happens when the time is zero. And this, by the way, is one of the reasons why it's super important to re-index the time, because these exponential growth formulas really only work if you re-index the time so the initial value is zero. So here I've got my initial value A is 3.6, and my growth rate is this average value of 1.5. Eight, nine. So the model should be capital R of T, that's capital R left parentheses T right parentheses, equals A, which is 3.6, times left parentheses 1.589 right parentheses to the T power. Let's check the model against the data in Desmos. We have the data graphed on the screen in a table with the time and the revenue, it's the same five data points we just looked at in the table of values, and it does look like it might be curving upwards just a little bit. Let's go ahead and include the graph of R of T. And we have a very nice fit to the data. Every data point is at least touching the model we've built. The model has a y-intercept of 3.6, and it is gently curving upward through those points as a standard exponential function with a horizontal asymptote of y equals zero. Let's try another problem. In this table of data, we have the average price of a U.S. hotel room from the years 2020 to 2015. First, let's check to see if the data might be linear. In other words, let's see if it has a consistent rate of change. Before we do that, we'll check the data to make sure that it is evenly spaced. The top row of data is years from 2010 to 2015, evenly spaced by year. So that's good. We have evenly spaced data. The second row is the average price. And reading across the table, that is $57, 61, 65, 69, 74, and 79. When we find an average rate of change, remember that we take the difference in the dependent variable over the difference in the independent variable. If I just do this first calculation off to the side, that would be 61 minus 57 divided by 2011 minus 2010. Of course, that denominator is going to be one, and the numerator will be four. So the difference between these is simply four. It's just the difference between 61 and 57. Because the denominator is always going to be one in these calculations, let's just do the difference in the numerators. Moving across, the next set would be 65 minus 61, which is 4. The next set is 69 minus 65, which is 4. The next set is 74 minus 69, which is 5. And the last set is 79 minus 74, which is 5. We do have relatively consistent data here. We have 4, 4, 4, 5, 5. It looks pretty good. This might be linear, but let's go ahead and check the data for exponentiality next. To check if the data might be exponential, we look for a consistent ratio of growth. Same set of data. We take every pair of data points and take the ratio of the dependent part. For our first pair, this means we do 61 divided by 57 which is 1.070. I'm rounding to three decimal places on these. The next pair would be 65 divided by 61, which is 1.066. The next pair is 69 divided by 65, which is 1.062. Then 74 divided by 69, or 1.073. 
And finally, 79 divided by 74, which is 1.068. And these growth ratios are also fairly consistent. So what's more likely, that the data is linear or that the data is exponential? In this case, it's really hard to say. With real-world data, the consistency of growth is not going to be perfect. So your best bet is to look at the data, test a few models, and then decide which one is the best fit for the calculations, or look at something in the real world that might give you a sense for what's more likely to be the case, linear or exponential growth. For this problem, let's go ahead and make both models. So I'm going to calculate an average for both the average rate of change and for the growth ratios. Let's start with that average rate of change. I'm going to add up the five values, 4 plus 4 plus 4 plus 5 plus 5, and divide that by 5. That's 22 divided by 5, or 4.4 for an average. For the growth ratios, again, I'm going to add up all of the growth ratios we had. That's 1.070 plus 1.066 plus 1.062 plus 1.073 plus 1.068, and I'm going to divide that by 5. And that gives us an average of 1.0678. Before I make these two models, I need to declare the variables. So let's start by re-indexing the time. Let's let t be the number of years since 2010. That means in our tables, 2010 is t equals 0, 2011 t equals 1, and then moving across the table until we get to 2015 being t equals 5. Let's declare capital P to be the average price of a U.S. hotel room. Now we do also know the initial value, which is when time is 0, is 57. And if we're doing a linear model, we know that the slope is that 4.4, the average of our average rate of change. And for the exponential model, I know the B value, the growth factor, is 1.0678. That's the average of the growth ratios. Let's go ahead and write our two models. We're going to have one model if this is linear and one model if this is exponential. A linear model would be capital P of T equals, and then it's usually uh, y equals mx plus b. So in this case, that would be 4.4t plus, it's not the b that's the growth factor, it's the b that's the initial value, the y-intercept, and that's 57 in this case. For the exponential, it's going to be p of t equals, and then my initial value, 57, times left parentheses, the growth factor, 1.0678, close that parentheses, and put that to the t power. Let's go over to Desmos and see how these models fit to the data. Well, I have to say that at first glance, this data over in Desmos does look like it follows a straight line to me. If I had to guess, I would have said right off the bat that this looked linear and that was probably a good guess. But let's go ahead and try both models. When I include the first model, we can see that it's an excellent fit to the data. Every data point at least touches the straight line that we get. As a reminder, it's a line with a y-intercept of 57 and a slope of 4.4. I'm going to turn that one off and turn on the exponential function. To remind you, this one has an initial value of 57 and a growth factor of 1.0678. Again, this looks like it's an excellent fit for the data. Every single point touches this model. It's very hard to say which one of these is correct. If I turn them both on, you can see there's very little difference between the graphs in this set of data points. When you move to the right, however, you will find that the exponential function grows a bit faster than the linear one, which is to be expected. If our projection was faster and faster growth, we'd probably go with an exponential model here. If we thought we would have slow, steady growth, a linear model might make more sense. Just one warning about these models. Not all models are linear or exponential. If you find both rates, the average rate of change and the growth ratio, and neither is particularly consistent for the data, then it's probably just some other kind of model. We had quadratic models, square root models. There are other things you can look for.